Moon up the sky. Moon up the sky. Welcome to video number 17 in fluid mechanics. So this is the third video now in section six, and we're looking at part B, which is called flow in pipes and ducts. And so we're gonna be looking at a lot of different things about both laminar and turbulent flow in ducts, okay? But really the emphasis here is gonna be on how do we calculate the pressure losses through a piping or a duct system, knowing that we have friction now and knowing that we have other sources of losses. So that'll really be the emphasis of where we're going with this material. Okay, so here's a breakdown of section six, but again, there's so many subsections that I'm only showing a portion of it here. The white text is what we'll cover in this video. So it's really part B there, flow in pipes and ducts, and essentially everything is leading us towards being able to calculate the head loss for a piping system. Okay, so now we're doing part B, which is called flow in pipes and ducts. So in the last video, we looked at the analytical solutions we could get with laminar flows. Part B now, we're gonna focus on flow in pipes and ducts. So we'll look a little bit at laminar flows, but mostly what we're doing here is introducing turbulent flows and they tend to be more common in engineering practice. So really the goal of part B here is to be able to take a piping system and calculate the pressure losses that are gonna result from this piping system. And that of course will make us better able to design these piping systems. And so we have to understand where the losses come from, where that friction comes from and the losses due to other things. So first let's look at, I've got a picture of sort of like a classic piping system here and you can see a few features. So this one, for example, has a valve here. You've got few pressure readings there. We've got some connection flanges shown here. And when you see this white stuff, don't let that throw you off. That's not the pipe itself. That's really just a plastic coating that's encasing um, an insulation that's around the outside of these pipes. And that's really common to see in factories and in uh, municipal pumping stations and that sort of thing. So these are the piping systems we're gonna be concerned with. And as we look at the friction, we're gonna sort of break this out into two broader categories. So we call major losses, the friction related losses, and then we use the term minor losses. So the friction losses then are the friction that's caused by the fluid flowing through the pipe and rubbing against the pipe wall. Minor losses though, we see how there's so many fittings and there's all these bends in the flow too, right? All these fittings and all these things, they're gonna cause losses as well. So the minor losses then are pipe fittings. And just as an example, you know, things like valves, um, elbows, etc. Okay, and the broader question we wanna ask in part B here is like what, what are the things that are gonna influence the pressure of an incompressible fluid as it flows through a pipe? So this is Bernoulli equation back from section four when we considered it in viscid. So this is when we ignored friction, right? When we ignored friction, okay, we see that the only way you can change pressure, this whole thing has to be constant, right? So the two things that can influence pressure really are just the flow velocity. And we know that the way we change flow velocity is to actually change the area of the pipe, the opening. You can see, for example, here, this has a larger pipe and it flows to uh, smaller pipes here. So that's how we get a velocity change in these systems and that's gonna match with a change in pressure as we saw in section four, right? You could also have elevation changes, right? So anytime you flow upwards in a system, as we've seen, you're gonna have a resulting drop in pressure. But Bernoulli, we know that's not applicable. This is not applicable anymore in the cases we have here. And, and that's for two reasons. Firstly, what does velocity even mean when you have turbulent flows or laminar flows and you have a huge velocity change across the pipe. So for starters, we're gonna have to work from some sort of average velocity, but also we ignored friction in Bernoulli, right? And we know that the friction is gonna generate a whole bunch of losses in the system. And so essentially what happens here is like friction's gonna reduce this constant here. And so it's gonna basically give us a third thing that changes the pressure of our system, right? So to summarize, pressure can be influenced by changes in velocity of the flow, changes in elevation of the flow, and now also we're gonna have to consider friction in the flow. That's what this section's gonna give us. Now, what I've shown below there, that's the laminar. So this expression right here, that's how the pressure change relates to the flow rate. When we calculated this in the last video, right, we had flow rate, right, and we said the flow rate was related to the delta P, change in pressure throughout our pipe. Right, so if you go ahead and rearrange that and say, well, how does the pressure drop change when you have a flow rate? That's gonna give us some information that will help us calculate pressure drops in these systems. So again, we're looking at this expression right here. That's only applicable though for laminar flows. So for laminar flows, if we wanna know the pressure drop throughout our system, we can see there that we just need to plug in these variables we know and then 
it's going to just be a function of our volumetric flow rate. So you expect a greater pressure drop in a system that has more flow, higher flow rate. And that makes it really easy to calculate for laminar systems, but we're going to want to know the pressure drop in turbulent systems. And so as we march through Part B in general, this is the question we're trying to answer. How do we figure out the pressure drop for turbulent flows, knowing, of course, we can't do it analytically. So we're going to have to look to the experimental conditions now and figure out how we have a reliable way to compute this and calculate the values for it. Okay, so we'll start in section 6.5 here. We're going to talk about the shear stress distribution in these pipe flows. Again, remembering that they're fully developed. That's why that comes up in the title there. As we talked about before, we're not considering specifically the entrance region in these calculations. And it's normally small anyways. So I've shown the shear stress distribution that we had from the pipe flow in the laminar case. It turns out this expression right here is actually applicable to both turbulent and laminar flows. But with the turbulent flows, we can't just substitute in a shear stress equation and solve for the velocity profile because it's too chaotic. Now, the wall shear stress can actually be calculated using this expression in both cases, so for laminar or for turbulent flows. So if we just substitute here, we just set the radius equal to capital R, where capital R is just the radius at the wall itself, right? So that's how we get the wall shear stress. We have this expression, and that's how we get our stress on the wall. But that doesn't complete the picture. So we can't get the friction losses from that because a lot of the friction losses, as we mentioned, it's also due to the rubbing of the fluid particles against other fluid particles that are neighboring them, right, that are moving slower or faster than they are. So in figuring out how we calculate this in turbulent flow, I've got a plot here of the velocity and you can see a few things plotted here. So I'll first show you that this line we're sort of seeing right here, I'll just kind of give, you know, that, that guy there. I didn't follow it exactly, but basically that, that line you're seeing there, that's just the actual velocity with time. So that's just what, if you went in and measured, that's what the U velocity is going to look like if you're just tracking a certain point over a span of time. So then you've got this flat line here in the middle, right, which is labeled as our time average or the mean value. And then what's shown here with this like U prime guy here is just the variation from the mean. So it's sort of a measure of like how turbulent the flow is or how much chaos or alteration or variation we have in our U velocity over time because the flow is turbulent, it's not laminar anymore. So it, you get this chaotic flow where that velocity is, you know, bouncing all over the place. So it turns out that that deviation, that U prime velocity, where we look at how the flow deviates from an average flow, that's actually how we calculate the stress. Now it was Reynolds who figured this out. He was an insightful guy mostly through observation and experiments, right? So if we go ahead and break out the shear stress, then we're looking at this expression right here. We can break out the shear stress from the laminar component and the turbulent component. Laminar knowing we can use this Newtonian expression we have, but when we go to the turbulent one there, it looks like this. And so it's a function of this U prime value that we can see in the plot. And the V prime too, where the V prime represents the randomly fluctuating velocity in the Y direction, or like normal to the flow direction. And maybe I'll show this here with our turbulent die example that we saw earlier for flow in a pipe. So here it's pretty turbulent, and I'll pause it and just kind of draw in so that the U primes are, because they sort of speed up or slow down relative to the mean velocity, and then the V prime would be like in this direction. Whereas in laminar flow, you wouldn't have the flow in that direction. But because of the turbulence, we, we do get some velocity fluctuations in that direction as well. And that's what it enhances this mixing and actually increases the shear stress too. Because we remember shear stress is like the rubbing from particles that have a different velocity. So now that's happening because of the turbulence, because of the randomly fluctuating velocity term. Now, this is called the Reynolds stress. And we'll just note here, it has this negative sign right here, but that's just because when you mathematically compute this U prime V prime, it also comes out negative. So this is actually a positive contribution. So when we look at the stress in a turbulent fluid and you're adding up sort of the laminar component, the turbulent component, the turbulent component is going to be added there. So it's going to be more, more shear stress when you have that turbulent component versus when you just have the laminar flow. So we expect higher shear in turbulent flows then. Okay, so this sort of explains where the shear stress comes from in these turbulent flows, but it still doesn't help us calculate the values of the shear stress or the pressure drop that results from these frictional losses. And we know from the laminar section, we were able to calculate all those things after we got a velocity 
velocity profile. So let's do that as our next step here for these turbulent flows. Let's go ahead and see if we can figure out what the velocity profiles look like. Remembering again that we can't do it analytically, so we're gonna do it observationally or looking at experiments, right? We can get an idea for what these velocity profiles look like in turbulent flows. So we have what's called the power law equation. And what we found out is if you measure these velocity profiles, you can actually just approximate the velocity profile in a turbulent flow for smooth pipes with what we call the empirical power law equation. So that's given right here. And that's, as you can see, similar in form to what we had in the laminar case, but the power law equation says we raise this and the exponent there is shown as one over n. So you have this n exponent and that basically gives us our velocity profile, right? That's just, it's just from measuring it. It's like, hey, look, this thing looks roughly like the power law. So let's just go ahead and use this approximation to figure out the turbulent flow. And it works really well. And even though it is a great approximation, just want to note there's one small drawback. It's not like really accurate, really close to the wall. But we saw earlier, we can actually calculate the wall shear stress with that expression from earlier. So it's not actually a big deal that like really close to the wall, it's not really accurate. We have kind of other ways to figure that out or measure that. So for the most part, like not super close to the wall, it's a great approximation. Okay, there were some experimental studies and evaluations of this that found that you can actually approximate and calculate this n value based on a Reynolds number. So that's that expression right there. And that gives us a relationship between n and Reynolds number that's really valuable because we see, right, that as that Reynolds number increases, the value of n increases as well. Finally, another way we can look at this is to take the average velocity. So once we have that velocity profile, we can go ahead and calculate like volumetric flow rates, which relate back to average velocities. And another neat way to look at this is to compare average velocity to the max velocity there at the center line. And we notice again, as n gets larger, meaning for higher Reynolds number, we have a a higher ratio of the average velocity to the centerline velocity, indicating that as n increases, let me just write this down in case you should be summarizing this though, like in your own words, as we talked about, but just you just want to have something here, right? Like as n increases, meaning also so as n increases, like Reynolds increases as well, right? As we saw, and as n increases, we're getting a more blunt profile, let's say, or a flatter profile. And then after all is said and done, we're marching more and more towards the engineering approach here. Oftentimes we just say, what's a really good approximation for most or the majority of cases, they find out that n equals seven quite a lot of the time, right? And so we have like this guy right here. I don't wanna box anything, right? Because they're all pretty valid. Just depends on your situation. That's called the one seventh power profile. 1 7th power profile. And that tends to be extremely representative for a lot of cases. But, you know, as we'll see in this, I mean, the accuracy of your calculation really is going to depend up upon how precise you need to be for whatever application you're in, right? Like you're learning as you march through your program that these types of solutions are not black and white, right? The 1 7th power law is great to give you an approximate profile that's going to be quite accurate. But if you need extremely high precision, you might want to actually go through and use your Reynolds number and calculate a more precise n which might take a little more time. So it's sort of, you're balancing now between things like how much time it takes to calculate and how accurate you need your result to be. So we wanna see like visually what these things look like. So in this plot, we see the laminar, so the parabolic flow profile shown there. Again, we're plotting velocity here. So you can think of like those arrows we usually draw. So that's like the laminar guy there, nicely parabolic. And R over R this time, we're scaling to a dimensionless radius. Right, so this is like center line is right here. And then that's like wall up here. So you can imagine the walls there, wall. And then, you know, if you extend these profiles down, so we've got a few plotted here, turbulent profiles where N is six or where N is 10. And you can see that the N is 10 is becoming more blunter or fuller, right? So it's flatter. And then I mirrored this. So if we put this one down here, it shows us the flow across the full pipe. We can see a little better there, like how much flatter it is along that midsection. Whereas the laminar flow would be that like parabolic flow. And so if we just quickly connect back for a second to our physical meaning. So as the Reynolds number goes up, you get a higher N, right? So you get say N equals 10 for a more turbulent flow. Let's say more turbulent, higher Reynolds number, right? And that makes physical sense to us or it should make physical sense to us right because you get that more fluctuating velocity profile down in the middle region and and so that levels off the velocity a little more because it transfers the momentum more right and then what we want to notice is so near the wall we mentioned that it's the gradient that really matters the du dy so you can see there's the laminar one there but that's what our turbulent profiles would indicate so 
That's why we remember the turbulent velocity profiles, it's applicable near the center line, right, where we have the turbulent effects, but not necessarily representative near the wall. Okay, I'm gonna show some videos here so we can see these flows and we can really see what's going on. And because a lot of this was mathematical or was me sort of just telling you that there was these experiments done, I think it's really gonna help us to see some of these experimental results in person. Okay, so we'll start with this one here. So we have what we would call a timeline, right? If we remember back to our earlier lectures in this course. So the timeline is gonna be shown by dropping this ink into a flow here. So I'll play this and we'll watch it. So the ink is dropped into the flow and then we'll see this low Reynolds number. We're gonna have a laminar flow profile. So as this is allowed to flow, right? The center line is faster and near the edges we have that zero velocity. So this is really demonstrating that parabolic profile. Okay, so that's a really great demonstration, right? Of, for the laminar case, parabolic, no slip conditions at the wall, fantastic. Now we're gonna look at a Reynolds of 10,000, right? So a turbulent case with water. We're gonna drop the timeline again, so we'll see the ink being dropped into the flow there. Then we're gonna have a turbulent flow that's coming down here, and just watch this profile, it's really neat. So you see this flow, Right, so very little variation along the center line. We see that it's a power law. And so we see near the middle of the flow, it's quite flat, quite blunt there when we have the relatively high Reynolds number. And so that really validates us using something like the power law, right? So I wanna show another video here. Okay, so in this one, we have water flowing through a pipe and it starts out as laminar. And I'll just pause it. I'll take a quick screenshot here while it's laminar to show you the velocity profile because What's happening, the reason this is laminar is because you have that perfectly parabolic shape. So the fluid that's coming out near the bottom here, if I just draw that parabola, the center line is the fastest velocity, right? So near the bottom, we have a slower velocity and that's why it falls. And we have this nice glass-like sheet here. So that velocity near the bottom is slower. So it falls and it spreads the flow out more. Now we'll see when it transitions to turbulence here. Ah, now this, the turbulence case, right? We have a much more uniform velocity profile across the pipe, and so it all shoots out and it stays together because all that velocity is traveling at roughly the same speed. So that's, again, sort of a demonstration of what we expect in laminar cases versus turbulent cases. Okay, now we've got section 6.7 here next, and we're working our way towards calculating the losses in our piping systems. And we're gonna do this now, starting with a discussion about the energy considerations in pipe flow. Okay, now we remember what we looked at back in section four. For example, the Bernoulli equation was representative of the energy in our flow. So what we have here with energy grade line, EGL, and remember we list this as EGL, but it's really just the same as the Bernoulli equation, just that we divided by G. When we look at that equation, we see here that we've got the pressure energy, the kinetic energy, so associated with the velocity, and then the elevation or potential energy that we're considering as well. Now that was back when we had frictionless flows. And as I kept mentioning, you know, when we get to section six, what we would do is basically put in another term there that was gonna account for our friction. So we've got at one section of a pipe, we've got the mechanical energy terms shown here, and then at a second section, the mechanical energy terms shown here. Now, if it was just Bernoulli flow, those two would be equal, but we know what's happening is there's actually gonna be a difference in those two due to the friction, and that's this term here, a term that we call head loss. Okay, now when we think about that term and we think about friction, what friction is doing is generating heat. So when we look at an energy balance, that term really is accounting for the thermal energy effectively that's generated from the friction. So that term has internal energy and it's got the heat transfer terms in there. So we just call that head loss when we're looking at pipe flow considerations. Now, if you look, if you just compare those two equations, right, one is multiplied by G and one is not. So it really depends on sort of what source you're looking at, what book you're looking at, what tables you're looking at. A lot of times you'll see another head loss coefficient that's represented by a capital H. And what that is, is just the head loss in that equation there, but the gravity is divided out. So if we're looking at this equation right here and we just wanna see the units, see, because look at a term like that. So if I take this HLT and then divide out gravity, that actually ends up being in units of length. So a lot of times we'll be talking about head loss. We'll maybe say 10 feet ahead, 20 feet ahead, which is a little bit squirrely, right? Because we know a head loss, we know that's an energy loss. And what we'll come to think of that as actually is a pressure loss because it's the pressure that's going to have to balance off those friction losses. So this little HLT, that's uh, total energy loss per unit mass, and then this capital 
uh, HLT right here, that's total energy loss per unit weight, but it has units of length. So don't let those confuse you. And this is why, as I've been saying throughout, really important that you keep units in these equations. So you really make sure you know what you're calculating here. So we've got just one other term here. See these alphas right here? That's a little bit new. And what you'll notice is if you compare sort of like what we had from Bernoulli before and what we've got here now, we mentioned we have to use average velocities. So, you know, without going into too much detail, I want to emphasize emphasize these alpha terms so we make sure we can calculate them. But I'll highlight another point of these calculations here that we'll see. So as I march through these sections, I'm going to do examples as well. And as you would have been familiar with from some of your earlier courses, when you do a calculation like this, let's say you calculate, you know, 10.1 feet ahead as your losses. I mean, that's, that's not exactly what your system is going to see, right? Like, of course not. That's just you know, a very good approximation. As a designer, you just need a feel for approximately what that number is going to be, right? There are all sorts of like real world considerations that you're not quite factoring in. So the precision level sort of varies on these calculations. So you'll see when you calculate a term like this alpha, what's happened here is we've wanted to substitute this average velocity. And then if you were basically deriving this from scratch, say from an energy balance, you end up with an integral like this, but you want to sub in the average velocity. So you introduce just a coefficient here and that Way, if you look at this term, so that's rho V D A, we know that's the mass flow rate, we've got our alpha coefficient, and we want to not have to integrate this, right? So you end up with a term like this, because you don't want to integrate. So what the alpha term is doing there, that's called our kinetic energy coefficient, its job is to just make it so this equation is very simple. So there's no integrals, right? And you have average velocities here and here. So that alpha coefficient, then you can solve that for certain cases by doing this integral. But as I mentioned, you know, the precision is not super high on this. So what we end up doing is we use approximate values for this alpha. And so I'll list those here. So if it's laminar, for example, alpha turns out to be 2.0, we can calculate that. And then turbulence, as I mentioned, mostly those are empirical or experimental. So for turbulent cases, if we go back and use, say, the power law, You'll end up with an alpha that sort of like ranges from 1.03 to 1.08 if n is 6 to about 10. And we, we mentioned uh, previously that n equals 7 is a very common one that we use to approximate the shape of the turbulent velocity profile. So what we do then is we substitute in 1.0 for alpha, and that makes our life really easy. So in a lot of times, you'll see that that coefficient's not there in this equation, right here and right here again. Hopefully you can still see my scribbling. A lot of times you won't see that. That's because you substituted 1.0. And again, that's because, as I've been mentioning, the turbulent cases are more predominant, right? So majority of cases are turbulent. So you may see that coefficient missing in some of these equations. For the purposes of this course, we're going to go ahead and sub in 1.0 in uh, almost all cases of that. Okay, so that sets us up. We've got our energy expression there. We know our losses are this H uh, sub LT term there. Capital or lowercase doesn't matter. That's just representing a total when we say that T there. Okay, now moving along to section 6.8. Calculation of head loss. The way we get the total head loss is that that's the sum of the major losses plus the minor losses. So a reminder again of major losses. Those are frictional effects. So the friction along the uh, pipe wall. And then this term here with the little M, we use that one for minor losses. Minor losses are fittings, um, entrances, area changes, all that sort of stuff. Mostly uh, fittings, valves, elbows, that kind of thing there. All right, let's do major losses first. So for major losses, we need to find what's called a friction factor. So if we take the equation above, we can simplify it to write just that the head loss is equal to our pressure difference. And what we're saying here is just we consider this head loss term to just be representative of a case where we don't have an elevation change and we don't have a velocity change. And that's because, as you know, we consider the velocity changes and the elevation changes separately in our calculation. So that's why we can see very clearly now when we talk about a head loss, we really just mean a pressure change, right? So our friction here is going to cause a pressure change. And we saw, as we discussed earlier, that's really the only term that can change in response to friction is pressure. And just a quick reminder of why it can't be velocity, of why the flow can't slow down, because we have to have a mass balance. So Q, the volumetric flow rate, must remain the same throughout the whole pipe. We have to have a mass balance. The mass coming in has to equal the mass leaving. So throughout the piping system, you can't have a velocity change from the frictional losses. That can only occur from area changes to ensure that the mass balance stays the same. So that's why losses only impact pressure and not velocity. 
But what can happen in our actual systems is we know you need a certain pressure difference to drive our flow forward. So if the losses are too high and that impacts the pressure too much, that can actually result in the whole system having a lower volumetric flow rate. So that's the correlation there is the frictional losses will drop the pressure. And then if the pressure drops, there's not enough of a pressure difference to drive our flow anymore. So our overall volumetric flow rate can decrease at that point. But the examples will demonstrate this nicely. So now if we just do the laminar case quickly first here, we saw at the beginning of part B, we just rearranged, we had an exact solution, we had our analytical solution. So that analytical solution gave us the pressure drop as a function of our volumetric flow rate. So if I take pressure drop as a function of volumetric flow rate here. Now into here, I plug in velocity times area, right? And then I cancel terms off and simplify. We end up with this expression here. Okay, now I know my head loss is related to my pressure drop. Let me use a different color, right? So my head loss and pressure drop are related like this. And then, so I sub in here from that relationship and that introduces this density term down here. So then when I rearrange, you see, I can pull out a Reynolds number grouping and so I end up with this expression here after we simplify. Now it seems a little bit weird. We'll see why exactly we simplify that way. And again, I'm boxing because that is the final equation. So we see if we pause just for a second and reflect on that, really in laminar flows, then it's quite straightforward and we can get a very precise, again, analytical solution for that head loss term. We see that's just a function of the Reynolds number, the length L of the piping that we're dealing with, the velocity of the flow and the diameter of the pipe. And we can calculate that directly. Now we wanna know how to do this for turbulent flows though. So for turbulent flow, what we're gonna do is we can't get an analytical solution. So we're gonna use a dimensional analysis from section five. This is really a classic dimensionless analysis right here. So the first question we sort of ask is, okay, what are all the possible terms? What's all the possible things that can be influencing the pressure drop as we flow through a pipe? Now you can pause and see if you can piece that together yourself. We've done this a few times now. So you'll see how our intuition sort of grows each time we do this. We kind of get a sense for what are the variables that are gonna influence this. So I'll go through and, and rhyme them up. So again, we've got the size of the pipe, right? The diameter. Of course, these are all the things that the pressure drop is gonna relate to. L, right, that would be the length of the piping. E is actually roughness. We haven't really seen that before, but we do, of course, have an intuitive sense for how rough the inside of the pipe is would have an influence on our friction losses, the velocity of the flow. And then these two, again, density and viscosity, right? Those are the fluid properties. So more dense or more uh, viscous fluids would have a influence on the friction. Now, if you go ahead and just do like a Buckingham pie here, that's sort of a standard classic Buckingham pie. You'll end up with going from these. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms, three repeating parameters. So we end up with four pi parameters. So we've got the pressure grouping now, basically the Reynolds number, a length, a dimensionless length, and a dimensionless roughness. So those are the four things we need. We just rewrite Reynolds and we're gonna need to find this function. So that's all we did from that line to that line. And then here we're doing our pressure substitution again. So we know the friction losses are gonna be generating that pressure drop throughout our pipe there. So we sub in for our HL coefficient. Now, you remember at this point of dimensional analysis, like the only way to get that functionality is from experiments. So we did this for a smooth sphere, for example, and then generated a curve, right? In the case of the dinosaur, again, he took a whole bunch of information from different animals running and then plotted that on his curve to figure out what the functionality was. So essentially at this point, like right here, you're going to have to do experiments. And of course, this is a really important thing for engineers to calculate. So this has been done already. Thankfully, we don't have to go out and do experiments every time we want to calculate friction losses in a piping system. So to make heads or tails of what's going on, we first, the experiments show us that actually this length term here is directly proportional to our head loss term here. So we can pull that out of the function then, right? So we've pulled it out here and that's just make a note. So directly proportional to the dimensionless length, our head losses. And then because it's dimensionless, we can add coefficients. So you see, we add this little half here because half V squared, we want to make that proportional to kinetic energy. So now we need this functionality right here, function of Reynolds number and roughness, right? So we go ahead and call that F. This can actually have three lines if you want. That's the definition of F there. 
and that is our, I'll write that up here, friction factor. Okay, so then to calculate our head losses, right, you just need to substitute in here for HL. So once we figure out how to get that F, we can substitute in for this head loss, or I'll box this one out too because that one is used in practice as well. We just dividing by G, right? So it's just that's both of those are head loss terms. It's just they have different units. So they're really the exact same thing, right? Just in different sets of units. And you see, we just need to be able to calculate the head loss. I'll throw it in purple here. So this is gonna be from graphs or from equations, and then we're gonna substitute in based on our system for these variables here, and that's how we calculate the head losses. So the question is, how do we get F, right? That's the big question, that's the thing we need. So we know it's gonna be a plot, it's gonna be a graph. Okay, so as expected, we've got, when we look at F, right up here, right? This is just saying is a function of, so F is a function of Reynolds number and roughness. So this plot gives us friction factor plotted here. That's what we need to be able to do our calculations, right? It's plotted against Reynolds number, whole bunch of experimental data is in this curve, but then we also have a number of different curves where each curve, right, has a roughness value. So this is how a plot looks when we have to have three variables, right? We've got x-axis, y-axis, and then a whole series of different curves where each one has a different roughness. Okay, this curve is incredibly important to us. So this is called the Moody graph, named after the guy who came up with it, not, um, <laughs> not because it's Moody, right? So that's the Moody graph. And then we're gonna start by looking at laminar flow. So if HL now is defined as like F times L over D times V squared over two, as we define in the turbulence section, we plug in our laminar expression, and now you can see why we wrote it in that kind of weird way. And so in comparing these two, you can see our F term is actually 64 over Reynolds. So we look at the Moody graph here, and we see that's what's plotted here. So this straight line is laminar flow then, where F is just 64 over Reynolds. So 64 over Reynolds, right? That's just a linear expression between F and the Reynolds number. So that's easy to calculate. So we don't need the graph for that, but it is cool to show that on the graph because we're gonna do, we're gonna look at this graph for quite a while now and, and really hammer this home. This is super important for engineers because it's not just calculating the friction losses that are important. As engineers, we're also gonna need to know, for example, what size pump do we use? How do we make systems that have lower friction factors? All these things are really important. So in a, a graph like this really gives us the keys to understand like where's the friction coming from? How do we reduce the friction? So we notice something really interesting. As we're marching along, we're sort of increasing the Reynolds number, right? So we go from laminar flow and then we've got this critical section here shown with like this sort of blue shaded region where that says Reynolds critical. And then you can see what happens is, so if you have a system that's laminar and you increase the velocity a little bit and all of a sudden, you know, it flips over to being turbulent, potentially your friction factor goes from being somewhere down here and it it just shoots up right into this range here. So you're gonna see a dramatic jump in friction when you first go from a laminar to a turbulent system. Something definitely to be aware of, right? Okay, now each of these curves has a different roughness. So if we start at the bottom, labeled right there, smooth pipes, right at the bottom. So smooth in this case, meaning a roughness that's less than like 0 0.000001 in our dimensionless roughness numbers there. So when we get the smooth pipes, you see that's just a nice curve. And what this is really saying here is if you have a smooth pipe like that, now any increase in the Reynolds number, once you're turbulent, the more Reynolds number you have, the more turbulent your flow is, you're actually dropping in friction factor. So we can see as Reynolds number is increasing, I follow that curve, it's headed downward. So friction factors are dropping, right? now. If we look at the non-smooth pipes, so the rough pipes here, what's happening is you're getting, I'm just gonna pick this one right here. So you're getting a decrease, right? In what we're calling sort of the um, zone that comes just before the fully rough zone, right? So you see past that point, we're labeling that as the fully rough zone. So before you're in the fully rough zone, even for very rough pipes, you're seeing the same kind of trend. Increase the Reynolds number and you'll experience a drop in the friction factor. But then you hit this point, once you hit that dashed line, you are essentially perfectly straight. So that's called the fully rough zone. And what's happening there, the reason this F, if I just trace this out, right, that's arguably completely straight. So what's happening is F is independent of the Reynolds number here. Now, why is that? I wanna show you, and we're looking at these figures right here. So what's happening is when you see that velocity profile, you have this little viscous sublayer right here. 
And we remember shear is when you have rubbing due to adjacent particles moving at different velocities. So what we've called this viscous sublayer, that becomes dominant for where all our friction is. Now, as Reynolds increases, this flow becomes more and more blunt. So this section here gets moved down further and further. And so if we zoom in to this viscous sublayer region, eventually, right, that flow profile becomes so blunt that it actually overlaps this rough wall. So what happens is that we say this roughness is poking up or sticking into the flow now because the viscous sublayer would actually be smaller than the roughness itself. So that's actually the roughness of the pipe there. Now, when that happens, the roughness totally dominates the flow now. So it doesn't matter that the Reynolds number changes. It's just purely, you're gonna have friction factor is only a function of the relative roughness. That's why it's flat, you know, in the fully rough zone here. And that's also why if you look at where the fully rough zone initiates, right, if you have a smoother wall, as I'm showing, you know, in this circle here, right, as I move down this curve, we're getting smoother and smoother, the farther sort of down we go, down is smoother, right, from this relative roughness. And you can see it, it takes a higher Reynolds number, right, as I'm moving out here. So in the rough zone, it might be there, and then the smoother, it's here. So it ne means that that needs a higher Reynolds number to get into that region. And the higher Reynolds number is because at the higher Reynolds number, your viscous sublayer gets smaller. So that's why if you, if you have a smoother wall, to get those roughness effects poking into the flow, you have to be shrinking your viscous sublayer smaller and smaller. So this is where, like, you should have a, a whole series of notes here. Like I'll just summarize, but everything I've been saying, right? Like we really want to push the idea that you're thinking through these problems yourself, right? And definitely not sort of just copying what I'm saying. So you'll have some note, hopefully something like, you know, as like Reynolds increases, like the viscous sublayer shrinks some sort of note like that so you can make heads or tails of what's going on here because this is the kind of thing that to demonstrate we can really think through these problems we really sort of have an understanding of what's going on here i'd love to put a figure like this on an exam and just make sure you can walk me through it make sure we're really understanding this all right so that's essentially everything we have there and in solving problems really make sure you know how to use this graph as well right so you're going to need to calculate reynolds number you're going to need to calculate a relative roughness and then you go on the curve and you figure out what your friction factor is going to be. Now, when you look up roughness, you're going to have a table kind of like this one here. And keep in mind when they say roughness for pipes, those are generally brand new pipes, right? So you get a table like this where it lists off, you know, the different kinds of pipes and it gives you the roughness when you buy them when they're brand new. But the picture shown down here has what we would call scaling. So over time, these pipes can wear out or they can rust or they can actually, if there's a lot of impurities within the water itself, you can get calcium deposits, things like that, or dirt, just flat out dirt will cause scaling on the pipe. And so you get actually quite a different diameter if pipes are in service for a while. So what happens is the roughness increases then as a pipe experiences its lifetime. So you might have a change. If, you, if you're going to install a brand new system, you might have to factor in the fact that you'll want to size your pump differently if you're expecting this thing to operate for sort of like 10 or 20 years. You know over time there's going to be an increase in that friction factor, right? You see, these, these kind of things really important. We bring that forward into our designs here. Now, the Moody chart, I strongly recommend you use the Moody chart, but sometimes you might need to create an algorithm or a spreadsheet or something. So there are expressions for these. I'll put these in boxes as well. This one's called the Colebrook. And you'll notice there's F on both sides. This makes it iterative. So you have to start with a guess for F and then solve through this. I A lot of times we'll notice students um, on the exam who haven't been putting any effort into the course will try to use the Colebrook for the first time and be completely stressed out about it because they don't realize you have to iterate. So again, don't leave this stuff till the last minute, right? If, if you are going to use these expressions, make sure you learn how and you get familiar with it. There's another one we have that's not as accurate, but it's not iterative, right? So this one's the Holland expression. Reynolds uh, greater than 3000 is where it applies for. So we can box that one too if we want. I'm still recommending that we use the Moody diagram when we're solving problems. And then we also have the curve there that's plotted. So that's this expression here. And that's the Blasius expression. And I'll write, so for smooth pipes. And then when you have a more simple expression like that, what that actually lets you do is substrate in for the wall shear stress. So in the simpler cases, you can have a, like a wall stress expression. 
and that's not going to come into play for us, as I mentioned. So this friction factor, that's all we need to calculate our pressure losses. But you'll see later if you're doing maybe a more precise or detailed analysis where you need the wall shear stress, that kind of expression can come in handy. So we'll put that there for completeness. But focusing on the fact that really what we're trying to do here is get these F values. And it's also further evidence of how important our dimensional analysis was from section five. Okay, that takes care of all the major losses for us. Now we're going to do the minor losses. So minor losses, as I mentioned, are things like fittings, fittings or otherwise sort of physical, practical imperfections in our flow network or our piping system, right? So minor losses, then we can imagine these kind of things are going to be tabulated. And so the expression we have for that, if you just want to look at how do you calculate the HL sub M term, in this case, you're going to have this expression right here. And K is going to be a coefficient that's going to be tabulated based on the specific fitting or the specific thing you're looking for. Now, there is another expression for doing this. So in exact sort of parallel way to do this is called an equivalent length, right? So you may come across tables where you have this equivalent length. And what that's doing then is instead of giving you this K coefficient, if we just look at this table here, for example, that table gives you a K coefficient, they could also give you an equivalent length, meaning in that case, you would just use the friction factor here for the pipe, the pipe that you're in. And then that equivalent length is just saying like, for example, maybe you have an elbow, right? That's made out of the exact same material that your pipe's made of. So instead of having a K coefficient, you might say, okay, well that elbow is like as if there was an extra two meters of pipe in it, right? So that equivalent length then would be the two meters. You just punch in that number there and calculate your minor losses that way. After we march through these, I'm gonna do an example to demonstrate how we use the coefficient here. So we're gonna march through now a whole bunch of different things that can cause losses. And so as I mentioned, I'm gonna use these coefficients later, but it's important again as designers, as engineers who wanna sort of challenge the way things are done, make creative new designs, right? We wanna look at these different setups to see, okay, what is the loss coefficient? How do I make systems that have a minimized loss coefficient, for example? So when you have inlets and exits, so this is showing like a pipe entrance, for example, on the side of a tank. So in some cases you might have re-entrant, right? Where the pipe actually sticks sort of right into the tank that it's mounted to. Now that has a very high loss coefficient, 0.78. If you make it square edge, for example, you don't have the pipe sticking in, we'd expect, as we see here, less loss coefficient. And if you can make this a nice rounded one, which as we know will be more complicated to make, but you'll experience much lower losses as we see the K coefficients here based on the radius, right? The more curved it is, we could potentially get that all the way down to 0 0.04. So an almost negligible amount of loss if we just rounded out the pipe. Really important for us to look at these and understand that kind of thing, right? While at the same time knowing, as we'll see later, this K gets subbed into our equation and that's how we figure out our minor losses. So we'll talk for a second the physics of what's actually happening here. So let's have a real detailed look at a figure of this here. What happens is the reason there our losses is because when you have flow coming from a tank and it's trying to enter into this pipe here as these arrows are demonstrating, right? The flow is trying to enter, but as we can see what happens is there's this little region of what's called separated flow. Now what causes that is as you have these molecules, these little fluid particles, right? They're trying to flow inside of here. They can't turn the corner right? They can't turn that corner very hard. So as they turn this corner, they're actually carried into a smaller region here. So this is called separated flow. And this region right here that I'm coloring in, you don't have any of the flow that's coming from the tank able to enter in that region. So it actually squeezes the pipe down. Now, if we look at the plot below, we know what that's done. This vena contracta, it's called, is reduce the amount of area. So it makes the area smaller. And we know at this point of the course now, a smaller area is gonna re result in a quicker velocity. So the flow rate's gotta stay the same. So it means a smaller area has a higher velocity. And we know where it's getting that velocity is from the pressure. So looking in this plot below, that's a pressure plot. And now, so we'll see the pressure of that flow drop and that's our dynamic pressure term there. So to accelerate that flow, basically you'll have a pressure drop. And then if you were gonna recover that kinetic energy, if you had a full recovery, you'd get that pressure back, but it turns out you don't, right? So this is where the losses are coming from. As this flow is redistributed, the actual pressure is right here. So that pressure is much lower in actual reality cases as a result of the vena contracta because you're having uh, some circulated flow here, right? You're causing heat increase or friction because of that flow separation. And so that's gonna sap up some of the energy as well. 
So that's physically why it's happening. And again, that's physically why the rounded corners are better because the rounded corners allow the flow to smoothly transition into the pipe without having that separation zone. And so thus we don't have a vena contracta or a smaller area that the flow is forced to flow through. Okay, enlargements and contractions, really it's the really the exact same thing we just saw, except what this is, is you're going from one size pipe to another size pipe. And it probably doesn't take a whole lot of convincing to know like these straight edge contractions or straight edge expansions are not conducive to minimizing losses. So in this kind of a case, you'll see again, they're plotting the K. So you can go ahead and calculate the K. Expansion curve, so that's that curve. That's the expansion curve. And the contraction is on the left, expansion on the right. So you just calculate what your area ratio is. Area ratio is shown in the figures here. And then you go ahead and figure out your K. But, but it's important, there's a few things that are kind of neat about this, right? So the contraction case, we would imagine, for example, let's say I made this A1 area really big. Like let's say I made it infinity. Then I would just have the tank I just had, right? So let's do a test on this. Let's do a little test as if we're really skeptical and let's say, okay, does this data actually match what we just saw? Now you can see if I make A1 infinity, that makes this A1 infinity right here. So the area ratio will go to zero if I do that. So if I look at my contraction curve here, when the area is zero, that's this one here, it went to 0 0.5 and not hugely surprisingly for a square edged one, right? It matches at 0 0.5. Okay, just an interesting little test we can do on these plots, right? If you're feeling really skeptical. Okay, now we can counterbalance this sharp edge contraction and expansions with what we normally do in piping systems. So these are gradual contractions. And so these are loss coefficients. So normally you really, you just have to look at the table to see what's going on here. So it's listing them as K and again, see that line right there, most times the table will be pretty clear because sometimes you'll have to get this information directly from the manufacturer themselves, right? So out in practice, when you're an engineer in the field, maybe like you're going to have actual fittings, right? That you purchased from a company and some they're going to come with their loss coefficients because you need to calculate them directly. So you don't necessarily have to use a generic table that tells you what an elbow is for the literally the elbow you buy, they will come with their own loss coefficient table. So it helps you increase precision there. So in this one, for example, we can see this would be like a generic case for gradual contractions. And we see the more gradual it is. So you go from the very sharp edge we had above, if that theta is 180 degrees, you get those sharp edged contractions. And but then if you go all the way down to only 10 degrees, it's very, very gradual. And the K's drop dramatically down to only about 0 0.05. So you might be thinking, well, why the heck don't we all always just do it gradually? Well, remember, there are other sacrifices, right? So it's a little more expensive, right, to buy pipes that have a gradual change. That's harder to manufacture. So you're paying more for that. But also you need space, right, to install that gradual contraction. You just might not have it. You might need to have a bend coming up before the contraction's done. So you're going to be space restricted in what you can do. So there are a lot of factors at play here that you need to factor in when you're designing a system like this. I just want to show you this coefficient right here. So you might sometimes come across CP. It's not something in this course that I'm going to test, but it's really important that we have an understanding of how, again, as a designer, we could go through and make better contractions. So what this is showing, for example, is it's a pressure coefficient. And if you look at it closely, that static pressure change is then divided by the total dynamic pressure you would have had upon entering your system. So this ratio is really saying, well, how much pressure drop do I generate across my contraction versus the total amount of dynamic pressure I have when I first encounter this contraction? And so what that helps us do is design. We want to know exactly what kind of angle we should use, or this is for would be for the engineers that are actually designing the contractions themselves. So this CPI shows an ideal one where it's compared against the aspect ratio. And that ideal case corresponds to a frictionless case. So then your loss coefficient becomes just a comparison between the pressure coefficient you actually have versus the ideal case if there was no friction, right? And again, take home message that for this is just that it exists that there are these ways. And if you want to be designing, you know, the best contractions you can have or the best pipe fittings you can have. You really dive deep on stuff like this. I'm not going to dive deep on it now, but it, it pays to know that that kind of stuff is out there. So that would be a plot corresponding to our pressure coefficients. And again, that's the type of thing if you're designing these pipe fittings that you would need. So pipe bends as well. Pipe bends is really neat. So 
In this case, I've just shown some plots here that they use an equivalent length instead. So really the same type of thing as k, it's just you plug it into the equation a different way, right? And so you see on a plot on the left, for example, there's a bit of a trade-off. So if you're starting here, you can actually decrease the equivalent length by giving yourself a nice smooth radius, you know, but then down to here, but then beyond this point, because increasing that radius increases the length of the pipe, you're sort of having friction losses grow again because that pipe fitting just becomes so long. And there's friction associated with the length of the pipe as well. So in bends, we really want to understand, we know how to calculate the friction losses here, right? But let's take a more detailed look at these figures here because I want to talk about why. So again, in a bend, right, if you look at A, firstly here, right, so these particles that are flowing, the fluid flowing, when it makes that corner, can't come right around and flow down here. It's got to continue gradually around this corner. And so you get what's shown here is separated flow. So right in here, you get this sort of backflow. You get these little vortices in that region there. And so again, the effect on the flow profile is you're squeezing it out here, you're forcing it to become quicker. And so you're gonna have this K factor. And if we look at B, so then of course, as an engineer, you gotta think, what are some, are there some very simple, very inexpensive ways I can get around this? Well, yeah, if you just help the fluid flow down around this corner, what you can do, for example, is put these little guide veins here, right? Now you're sort of helping the fluid get down and use more of the pipe because these guide veins are gonna help push it along around the corner. Now you're still going to have losses, of course, but you see they're dramatically lower when you have the guide veins helping the fluid flow. So if it's possible to put guide veins in and it's, you know, of a practical expense, generally there's trade-offs, right? But that's one strategy you could do to minimize your friction losses. Okay. Valves and fittings. So you'll come across tables. I've shown a few different kinds here. This one, again, it shows you equivalent length and Generally, like I mentioned, it always shows you the equation, right? So that corresponds to our equation from earlier because different manufacturers might do this in different ways. Commonly, you're going to see K, I think. K is going to come up most often. So that's that's what we're going to focus on. So here's another table where, again, they're listing sort of like these are Ks for this expression. And then you've got, you know, elbows, bends, Ts, threaded union valves, etc. And it sort of shows you like uh, fully open, right? Like halfway closed. You got swing check valves for forward flow or backward flow. And you can see, you know, as a designer, right? So looking at stuff like this, you can see I can compare Ks for different elbows and see that like, oh, let me compare like a 90 degree long radius. So I've got 0.2 when it's flanged, but 0.7 when it's threaded, right? So the flanged one is better than the threaded one. There's lower losses there at 0.2 than at 0.7. Okay, now here's where I would do an example. And I've put this in the following video. It's example 6.2, where I do a full calculation for a piping system in a house. So we see the whole thing start to finish on how you'd calculate the head loss. So definitely make sure you check that out. Okay, so a quick summary of what we covered in this video. So we started part B, flows in pipes and ducts. And our overall goal here is to calculate the head loss in our piping systems. So we started by looking at turbulent flows. And then how do we get the shear stress and the velocity profiles for turbulent flows? Then we looked at the energy considerations in pipes. So looking at the energy loss that's caused by having friction in your pipes. Then basically we focused on how, how you calculate that friction coefficient. So it's pretty straightforward and laminar because we have an analytical solution, but a little more complex. We use some experimental values, a dimensional analysis, and then a graph right? When we're in turbulent flow and there's going to be an example. And it's really important to check out this example because it really connects everything we've covered in this video really, really well. So that's in a separate video now. And I recommend you watch that as close as possible to watching this video. Okay. And that's all for video number 17. I'm going to say two bye-byes. Okay. Two bye-byes.